Book Two, Chapter Two, Part Two of Three of The Beautiful and Damned. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Beautiful and Damned by F. Scott Fitzgerald. Book Two, Chapter Two, Symposium. Part Two of Three. Winter. She rolled over on her back and lay still for a moment in the great bed, watching the February sun suffer one last attenuated refinement in its passage through the leaded panes into the room. For a time she had no accurate sense of her whereabouts, or of the events of the day before, or the day before that. Then, like a suspended pendulum, memory began to beat out its story, releasing with each swing a burdened quota of time until her life was given back to her. She could hear, now, Anthony's troubled breathing beside her. She could smell whiskey and cigarette smoke. She noticed that she lacked complete muscular control. When she moved, it was not a sinuous motion with the resultant strain distributed easily over her body. It was a tremendous effort of her nervous system, as though each time she were hypnotizing herself into performing an impossible action. She was in the bathroom, brushing her teeth to get rid of that intolerable taste, then back by the bedside, listening to the rattle of Bounds's key in the outer door. "'Wake up, Anthony,' she said sharply. She climbed into bed beside him and closed her eyes. Almost the last thing she remembered was a conversation with Mr. and Mrs. Lacey. Mrs. Lacey had said, "'Sure you don't want us to get you a taxi?' And Anthony had replied that he guessed they could walk over to Fifth all right. Then they had both attempted, imprudently, to bow— and collapsed absurdly into a battalion of empty milk bottles just outside the door. There must have been two dozen milk bottles standing open-mouthed in the dark. She could conceive of no plausible explanation of those milk bottles. Perhaps they had been attracted by the singing in the Lacey house, and had hurried over agape with wonder to see the fun. Well, they'd had the worst of it, though it seemed that she and Anthony never would get up, the perverse things rolled so. Still, they had found a taxi— my meter's broken, and it'll cost you a dollar and a half to get home, said the taxi driver. Well, said Anthony, I'm young Packy McFarland, and if you'll come down here, I'll beat you till you can't stand up. At that point, the man had driven off without them. They must have found another taxi, for they were in the apartment. What time is it? Anthony was sitting up in bed, staring at her with owlish precision. This was obviously a rhetorical question. Gloria could think of no reason why she should be expected to know the time. "'Golly, I feel like the devil,' muttered Anthony dispassionately. Relaxing, he tumbled back upon his pillow. "'Bring on your grim reaper.' "'Anthony, how did we finally get home last night?' "'Taxi.' "'Oh.' Then, after a pause, "'Did you put me to bed?' "'I don't know. Seems to me you put me to bed. What day is it?' "'Tuesday.' "'Tuesday?' I hope so. If it's Wednesday, I've got to start work at that idiotic place. It's supposed to be down at nine or some such ungodly hour. Ask Bounds, suggested Gloria feebly. Bounds, he called. Sprightly, sober, a voice from a world that it seemed in the past two days they had left forever, Bounds sprang in short steps down the hall and appeared in the half-darkness of the door. What day, Bounds? February the 22nd, I think, sir. I mean, day of the week. Tuesday, sir. Thanks. After a pause, are you ready for breakfast, sir? Yes, and Bounds, before you get it, will you make a pitcher of water and set it here beside the bed? I'm a little thirsty. Yes, sir. Bounds retreated in sober dignity down the hall. Lincoln's birthday, affirmed Anthony without enthusiasm, or St. Valentine's or somebody's. When did we start on this insane party? Sunday night. After prayers, he suggested sardonically. We raced all over town in those hansoms, and Maury sat up with his driver, don't you remember? Then we came home and he tried to cook some bacon, came out of the pantry with a few blackened remains, insisting it was fried to the proverbial crisp. Both of them laughed, spontaneously but with some difficulty and lying there side by side, reviewed the chain of events that had ended in this rusty and chaotic dawn. They had been in New York for almost four months, 
since the country had grown too cool in late October. They had given up California this year, partly because of lack of funds, partly with the idea of growing abroad should this interminable war, persisting now into its second year, end during the winter. Of late their income had lost elasticity. No longer did it stretch to cover gay whims and pleasant extravagances, and Anthony had spent many puzzled and unsatisfactory hours over a densely figured pad, making remarkable budgets that left huge margins for amusements, trips, etc., and trying to apportion, even approximately, their past expenditures. He remembered a time when, in going on a party with his two best friends, he and Maury had invariably paid more than their share of the expenses. They would buy the tickets for the theater or squabble between themselves for the dinner check. It had seemed fitting. Dick, with his naivete and his astonishing fund of information about himself, had been a diverting, almost juvenile figure, court jester to their royalty. But this was no longer true. It was Dick who always had money. It was Anthony who entertained within limitations, always accepting occasional, wild, wine-inspired, check-cashing parties. And it was Anthony who was solemn about it the next morning, and told the scornful and disgusted Gloria that they'd have to be more careful next time. In the two years since the publication of The Demon Lover, Dick had made over $25,000, most of it lately, when the reward of the author of fiction had begun to swell unprecedentedly as a result of the voracious hunger of the motion pictures for plots. He received $700 for every story, at that time a large emolument for such a young man, he was not quite thirty, and for every one that contained enough action, kissing, shooting, and sacrificing, for the movies, he obtained an additional thousand. His stories varied. There was a measure of vitality and a sort of instinctive technique in all of them, but none attained the personality of the demon lover, and there were several that Anthony considered downright cheap. These, Dick explained severely, were to widen his audience. Wasn't it true that men who had attained real permanence, from Shakespeare to Mark Twain, had appealed to the many as well as to the elect? Though Anthony and Maury disagreed, Gloria told him to go ahead and make as much money as he could. That was the only thing that counted, anyhow. Maury, a little stouter, faintly mellower, and more complacent, had gone to work in Philadelphia. He came to New York once or twice a month, and on such occasions the four of them traveled the popular routes from dinner to the theater, thence to the frolic, or, perhaps at the urging of the ever-curious Gloria, to one of the cellars of Greenwich Village, notorious through the furious but short-lived vogue of the new poetry movement. In January, after many monologues directed at his reticent wife, Anthony determined to get something to do, for the winter at any rate. He wanted to please his grandfather, and even, in a measure, to see how he liked it himself. He discovered during several tentative semi-social calls that employers were not interested in a young man who was only going to try it for a few months or so. As the grandson of Adam Patch, he was received everywhere with marked courtesy, but the old man was a back number now. The heyday of his fame, as first an oppressor and then an uplifter of the people, had been during the twenty years preceding his retirement. Anthony even found several of the younger men who were under the impression that Adam Patch had been dead for some years. Eventually, Anthony went to his grandfather and asked his advice, which turned out to be that he should enter the bond business as a salesman, a tedious suggestion to Anthony, but one that, in the end, he determined to follow. Sheer money and deft manipulation had fascinations under all circumstances, while almost any side of manufacturing would be insufferably dull. He considered newspaper work, but decided that the hours were not ordered for a married man, and he lingered over pleasant fancies of himself, either as editor of a brilliant weekly of opinion, an American Mercure de France, or as scintillant producer of satiric comedy and Parisian musical review. However, the approaches to these latter guilds seemed to be guarded by professional secrets. Men drifted into them by the devious highways of writing and acting. It was palpably impossible to get on a magazine unless you had been on one before. So in the end, he entered, by way of his grandfather's letter, that sanctum Americanum where sat the president of Wilson, Heimer, and Hardy at his cleared desk, and issued therefrom employed. He was to begin work on the 23rd of February. 
In tribute to the momentous occasion, this two-day revel had been planned, since, he said, after he began working he'd have to get to bed early during the week. Maury Noble had arrived from Philadelphia on a trip that had to do with seeing some man in Wall Street, whom, incidentally, he failed to see, and Richard Caramel had been half persuaded, half tricked into joining them. They had condescended to a wet and fashionable wedding on Monday afternoon, and in the evening had occurred the denouement. Gloria, going beyond her accustomed limit of four precisely timed cocktails, led them on as gay and joyous a bacchanal as they had ever known, disclosing an astonishing knowledge of ballet steps, and singing songs which she confessed had been taught her by her cook when she was innocent and seventeen. She repeated these by request at intervals throughout the evening with such frank conviviality that Anthony, far from being annoyed, was gratified at this fresh source of entertainment. The occasion was memorable in other ways, a long conversation between Maury and a defunct crab, which he was dragging around on the end of a string, as to whether the crab was fully conversant in the applications of the binomial theorem, and the aforementioned race in two handsome cabs, with the sedate and impressive shadows of Fifth Avenue for audience, ending in a labyrinthine escape into the darkness of Central Park. Finally, Anthony and Gloria had paid a call on some wild young married people, the Lacys, and collapsed in the empty milk bottles. Morning now, theirs to add up the checks cashed here and there in clubs, stores, restaurants, theirs to air the dank staleness of wine and cigarettes out of the tall blue front room, to pick up the broken glass and brush at the stained fabric of chairs and sofas, to give bounds, suits, and dresses for the cleaners. Finally, to take their smothery, half-feverish bodies and faded, depressed spirits out into the chill air of February, that life might go on, and Wilson, Hymer, and Hardy obtain the services of a vigorous man at nine the next morning. "'Do you remember,' called Anthony from the bathroom, when Moray got out at the corner of 110th Street and acted as a traffic cop, beckoning cars forward and motioning them back, they must have thought he was a private detective. After each reminiscence they both laughed inordinately, their overwrought nerves responding as acutely and janglingly to mirth as to depression. Gloria at the mirror was wondering at the splendid color and freshness of her face. It seemed she had never looked so well, though her stomach hurt her and her head was aching furiously. The day passed slowly. Anthony, riding in a taxi to his brokers to borrow money on a bond, found that he had only two dollars in his pocket. The fare would cost all of that, but he felt that on this particular occasion he could not have endured the subway. When the taxi meter reached his limit, he must get out and walk. With this, his mind drifted off into one of its characteristic daydreams. In this dream, he discovered that the meter was going too fast. The driver had dishonestly adjusted it. Calmly, he reached his destination and then nonchalantly handed the man what he justly owed him. The man showed fight, but almost before his hands were up, Anthony had knocked him down with one terrific blow, and when he rose, Anthony quickly sidestepped and floored him definitely with a crack in the temple. He was in court now. The judge had fined him five dollars, and he had no money. Would the court take his check? Ah, but the court did not know him. Well, he could identify himself by having them call his apartment. They did so. Yes, it was Mrs. Anthony Patch speaking. But how did she know that this man was her husband? How could she know? Let the police sergeant ask her if she remembered the milk bottles. He leaned forward hurriedly and tapped at the glass. The taxi was only at Brooklyn Bridge, but the meter showed a dollar and eighty cents, and Anthony would never have omitted the ten percent tip. Later in the afternoon, he returned to the apartment. Gloria had also been out, shopping, and was asleep, curled in the corner of the sofa with her purchase locked securely in her arms. Her face was as untroubled as a little girl's, and the bundle she pressed tightly to her bosom was a child's doll a profound and infinitely healing balm to her disturbed and childish heart. Destiny It was with this party, more especially with Gloria's part in it, that a decided change began to come over their way of living. The magnificent attitude of not giving a damn altered overnight. From being a mere tenant of Gloria's, it became the entire solace and justification for what they chose to do and what consequence it brought. 
not to be sorry, not to lose one cry of regret, to live according to a clear code of honor toward each other, and to seek the moment's happiness as fervently and persistently as possible. No one cares about us but ourselves, Anthony, she said one day. It'd be ridiculous for me to go about pretending I felt any obligations toward the world, and as for worrying what people think about me, I simply don't, that's all. Since I was a little girl in dancing school, I've been criticized by the mothers of all the little girls who weren't as popular as I was, and I've always looked on criticism as a sort of envious tribute. This was because of a party in the Boul Mitch one night, where Constance Merriam had seen her as one of a highly stimulated party of four. Constance Merriam, as an old school friend, had gone to the trouble of inviting her to lunch the next day, in order to inform her how terrible it was. I told her I couldn't see it. Gloria told Anthony. Eric Merriam is a sort of sublimated Percy Walcott. You remember that man in Hot Springs I told you about? His idea of respecting Constance is to leave her at home with her sewing and her baby and her book, at such innocuous amusements, whenever he's going on a party that promises to be anything but deathly dull. Did you tell her that? I certain did, and I told her that what she really objected to was that I was having a better time than she was. Anthony applauded her. He was tremendously proud of Gloria, proud that she never failed to eclipse whatever other women might be in the party, proud that men were always glad to revel with her in great rowdy groups, without any attempt to do more than enjoy her beauty and the warmth of her vitality. These parties gradually became their chief source of entertainment. Still in love, still enormously interested in each other, they yet found, as spring drew near, that staying at home in the evening palled on them. Books were unreal. The old magic of being alone had long since vanished. Instead, they preferred to be bored by a stupid musical comedy, or go to dinner with the most uninteresting of their acquaintances, so long as there would be enough cocktails to keep the conversation from becoming utterly intolerable. A scattering of younger married people, who had been their friends in school or college, as well as a varied assortment of single men, began to think instinctively of them whenever color and excitement were needed so there was scarcely a day without its phone call, its, wondered what you were doing this evening. Wives, as a rule, were afraid of Gloria, her facile attainment of the center of the stage, her innocent but nevertheless disturbing way of becoming a favorite with husbands. These things drove them instinctively into an attitude of profound distrust, heightened by the fact that Gloria was largely unresponsive to any intimacy shown her by a woman. On the appointed Wednesday in February, Anthony had gone to the imposing offices of Wilson, Hymer, and Hardy, and listened to many vague instructions delivered by an energetic young man of about his own age, named Collar, who wore a defiant yellow pompadour, and in announcing himself as an assistant secretary, gave the impression that it was a tribute to exceptional ability. "'There's two kinds of men here, you'll find,' he said. "'There's the man who gets to be an assistant secretary or treasurer, gets his name in our folder here, before he's thirty. And there's the man who gets his name there at forty-five. The man who gets his name there at forty-five stays there the rest of his life. How about the man who gets it there at thirty? inquired Anthony politely. Why, he gets up here, you see. He pointed to a list of assistant vice presidents upon the folder. Or maybe he gets to be president or secretary or treasurer. And what about these over here? Those? Oh, those are the trustees, the men with capital. I see. Now, some people— continued Collar, think that whether a man gets started early or late depends on whether or not he's got a college education, but they're wrong. I see. I had one. I was Buckley, class of 1911, but when I came down to the street, I soon found that the things that would help me here weren't the fancy things I learned in college. In fact, I had to get a lot of fancy stuff out of my head. Anthony could not help wondering what possible fancy stuff he had learned at Buckley in 1911 an irrepressible idea that it was some sort of needlework recurred to him throughout the rest of the conversation. "'See that fellow over there?' Collar pointed to a youngish-looking man with handsome gray hair, sitting at a desk inside a mahogany railing. "'That's Mr. Ellinger, the first vice-president. Been everywhere, seen everything, got a fine education.' In vain did Anthony try to open his mind to the romance of finance— he could think of Mr. Ellinger only as one of the buyers of the handsome leather sets of Thackeray, Balzac, Hugo, and Gibbon that lined the walls of the big bookstores. 
Through the damp and uninspiring month of March, he was prepared for salesmanship. Lacking enthusiasm, he was capable of viewing the turmoil and bustle that surrounded him only as a fruitless, circumambient, striving toward an incomprehensible goal, tangibly evidenced only by the rival mansions of Mr. Frick and Mr. Carnegie on Fifth Avenue. That these portentous vice-presidents and trustees should actually be the fathers of the best men he had known at Harvard seemed to him incongruous. He ate in an employee's lunchroom upstairs with an uneasy suspicion that he was being uplifted, wondering through that first week if the dozens of young clerks, some of them alert and immaculate and just out of college, lived in flamboyant hope of crowding onto that narrow slip of cardboard before the catastrophic thirties. The conversation that interwove with the pattern of the day's work was all much of a piece. One discussed how Mr. Wilson had made his money, what method Mr. Hymer had employed, and the means resorted to by Mr. Hardy. One related age-old but eternally breathless anecdotes of the fortunes stumbled on precipitously in the street by a butcher, or a bartender, or a darned messenger boy by golly. And then one talked of the current gambles, and whether it was best to go out for a hundred thousand a year, or be content with twenty. During the preceding year, one of the assistant secretaries had invested all his savings in Bethlehem Steel. The story of his spectacular magnificence, of his haughty resignation in January, and of the triumphal palace he was now building in California, was the favorite office subject. The man's very name had acquired a magic significance, symbolizing, as he did, the aspirations of all good Americans. Anecdotes were told about him, how one of the presidents had advised him to sell, but, by golly, he had hung on, even bought on margin, and now look where he is. Such, obviously, was the stuff of life, a dizzy triumph dazzling the eyes of all of them, a gypsy siren to content them with meager wages and with the arithmetical improbability of their eventual success. To Anthony the notion became appalling. He felt that to succeed here the idea of success must grasp and limit his mind. It seemed to him that the essential element in these men at the top was their faith that their affairs were the very core of life. All other things being equal, self-assurance and opportunism won out over technical knowledge. It was obvious that the more expert work went on near the bottom, and so, with appropriate efficiency, the technical experts were kept there. His determination to stay in at night during the week did not survive, and a good half of the time he came to work with a splitting, sickish headache, and the crowded horror of the morning subway rigging in his ears like an echo of hell. Then, abruptly, he quit. He had remained in bed all one Monday, and late in the evening, overcome by one of those attacks of moody despair to which he periodically succumbed, he wrote and mailed a letter to Mr. Wilson, confessing that he considered himself ill-adapted to the work. Gloria, coming in from the theatre with Richard Caramel, found him on the lounge, silently staring at the high ceiling, more depressed and discouraged than he had been at any time since their marriage. She wanted him to whine. If he had, she would have reproached him bitterly, for she was not a little annoyed. But he only lay there so utterly miserable that she felt sorry for him, and kneeling down, she stroked his head, saying how little it mattered, how little anything mattered so long as they loved each other. It was like their first year, and Anthony, reacting to her cool hand, to her voice that was soft as breath itself upon his ear, became almost cheerful and talked with her of his future plans. He even regretted, silently, before he went to bed, that he had so hastily mailed his resignation. "'Even when everything seems rotten, you can't trust that judgment,' Gloria had said. "'It's the sum of all your judgments that counts.' In mid-April came a letter from the real estate agent in Marietta, encouraging them to take the gray house for another year at a slightly increased rental, and enclosing a lease made out for their signatures. For a week, lease and letter lay carelessly neglected on Anthony's desk. They had no intention of returning to Marietta. They were weary of the place, and had been bored most of the preceding summer. Besides, their car had deteriorated to a rattling mess of hypochondriacal metal, and a new one was financially inadvisable. But because of another wild revel, enduring through four days and participated in, at one time or another, by more than a dozen people, they did sign the lease. To their utter horror they signed and sent it, and immediately it seemed as though they heard the grey house, drably malevolent at last, licking its white chops and waiting to devour them. 
Anthony, where's that lease? She called in high alarm one Sunday morning, sick and sober to reality. Where did you leave it? It was here. Then she knew where it was. She remembered the house party they had planned on the crest of their exuberance. She remembered a room full of men to whose less exhilarated moments she and Anthony were of no importance, and Anthony's boast of the transcendent merit and seclusion of the gray house, that it was so isolated that it didn't matter how much noise went on there. Then Dick, who had visited them, cried enthusiastically that it was the best little house imaginable, and that they were idiotic not to take it for another summer. It had been easy to work themselves up to a sense of how hot and deserted the city was getting, of how cool and ambrosial were the charms of Marietta. Anthony had picked up the lease and waved it wildly, found Gloria happily acquiescent, and with one last burst of garrulous decision, during which all the men agreed with solemn handshakes that they would come out for a visit. Anthony, she cried, we've signed and sent it. What? The lease. What the devil? Oh, Anthony. There was utter misery in her voice. For the summer, for eternity, they had built themselves a prison. It seemed to strike at the last roots of their stability. Anthony thought they might arrange it with the real estate agent. They could no longer afford the double rent, and going to Marietta meant giving up his apartment, his reproachless apartment, with the exquisite bath and the rooms for which he had bought his furniture and hangings. It was the closest to a home that he had ever had, familiar with memories of four colorful years. But it was not arranged with the real estate agent, nor was it arranged at all. Dispiritedly, without even any talk of making the best of it, without even Gloria's all-sufficing, I don't care, they went back to the house that they now knew heeded neither youth nor love, only those austere and incommunicable memories that they could never share. THE SINISTER SUMMER There was a horror in the house that summer. It came with them and settled itself over the place like a somber pall, pervasive through the lower rooms, gradually spreading and climbing up the narrow stairs until it oppressed their very sleep. Anthony and Gloria grew to hate being there alone. Her bedroom, which had seemed so pink and young and delicate, appropriate to her pastel-shaded lingerie, tossed here and there on chair and bed, seemed now to whisper with its rustling curtains, Ah, my beautiful young lady, yours is not the first daintiness and delicacy that has faded here under the summer suns. Generations of unloved women have adored themselves by that glass for rustic lovers who paid no heed. Youth has come into this room in palest blue and left it in the gray cerements of despair, and through long nights many girls have lain awake where that bed stands, pouring out waves of misery into the darkness. Gloria finally tumbled all her clothes and ungeons ingloriously out of it, declaring that she had come to live with Anthony and making the excuse that one of her screens was rotten and admitted bugs. So her room was abandoned to insensitive guests, and they dressed and slept in her husband's chamber, which Gloria considered somehow good, as though Anthony's presence there had acted as exterminator of any uneasy shadows of the past that might have hovered about its walls. The distinction between good and bad ordered early and summarily out of both their lives, had been reinstated in another form. Gloria insisted that any one invited to the gray house must be good, which, in the case of a girl, meant that she must be either simple and reproachless, or, if otherwise, must possess a certain solidity and strength. Always intensely skeptical of her sex, her judgments were now concerned with the question of whether women were or were not clean. By uncleanliness she meant a variety of things, a lack of pride, a slackness in fiber, and, most of all, the unmistakable aura of promiscuity. Women soil easily, she said, far more easily than men. Unless a girl's very young and brave, it's almost impossible for her to go downhill without a certain hysterical animality, the cunning, dirty sort of animality. A man's different and I suppose that's why one of the commonest characters of romance is a man going gallantly to the devil. She was disposed to like many men, preferably those who gave her frank homage and unfailing entertainment, but often, with a flash of insight, she told Anthony that some one of his friends was merely using him, and consequently had best be left alone. Anthony customarily demurred, insisting that the accused was a good one, but he found that his judgment was more fallible than hers, memorably when, as it happened on several occasions, he was left with a succession of restaurant checks for which to render a solitary account. 
more from their fear of solitude than from any desire to go through the fuss and bother of entertaining they filled the house with guests every weekend and off and on through the week the weekend parties were much the same when the three or four men invited had arrived drinking was more or less in order followed by a hilarious dinner and a ride to the cradle beach country club which they had joined because it was inexpensive lively if not fashionable and almost a necessity for such occasions as these moreover it was of no great moment what one did there and so long as the patch party were reasonably inaudible it mattered little whether or not the social dictators of cradle beach saw the gay gloria imbibing cocktails in the supper room at frequent intervals during the evening saturday ended in a glamorous confusion it proving often necessary to assist a muddled guest to bed sunday brought the new york papers and a quiet morning of recuperating on the porch and sunday afternoon meant good-bye to the one or two guests who must return to the city and a great revival of drinking among the one or two who remained until the next day concluding in a convivial if not hilarious evening the faithful tana pedagogue by nature and man of all work by profession had returned with them among their more frequent guests a tradition had sprung up about him maury noble remarked one afternoon that his real name was tannenbaum and that he was a German agent kept in this country to disseminate Teutonic propaganda through Westchester County. And after that, mysterious letters began to arrive from Philadelphia, addressed to the bewildered Oriental as Lieutenant Emil Tannenbaum, containing a few cryptic messages signed General Staff, and adorned with an atmospheric double column of facetious Japanese. Anthony always handed them to Tanner without a smile, Hours afterward, the recipient could be found puzzling over them in the kitchen, and declaring earnestly that the perpendicular symbols were not Japanese, nor anything resembling Japanese. Gloria had taken a strong dislike to the man ever since the day when, returning unexpectedly from the village, she had discovered him reclining on Anthony's bed, puzzling out a newspaper. It was the instinct of all servants to be fond of Anthony and to detest Gloria, and Tanner was no exception to the rule but he was thoroughly afraid of her, and made plain his aversion only in his moodier moments by subtly addressing Anthony with remarks intended for her ear. "'What Miss Pats want dinner?' he would say, looking at his master. Or else he would comment about the bitter selfishness of American peoples, in such manner that there was no doubt who were the peoples referred to. But they dared not dismiss him. Such a step would have been abhorrent to their inertia." They endured Tana as they endured ill weather and sickness of the body and the estimable will of God, as they endured all things, even themselves. End of Book Two, Chapter Two, Part Two of Three.